Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar. My name is Jeff Kenvin, and I'm the Technical Director at Micromerdix Instrument Corporation. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple engagement tools you can use. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. Additional materials are available in the resource list. We encourage you to download any resources or links that you may find useful. Some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off your VPN is recommended. If your slides are behind, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. If you experience any problems during this session, you can find answers to some common technical issues located in the Help Engagement tool at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available after today's webcast and will be emailed to you once the session has concluded. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Julian Hungerford. Dr. Hungerford joined Micromerdics in 2020 as an application scientist. Julian's expertise is in the areas of physisorption, characterization of porous materials, and separations. Julian, it is an honor for me to introduce you today. We are so glad you could be here today to share your insights on sample preparation and the impact on results. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you for everyone for attending my presentation today. Today, I'm going to be presenting about sample preparation and the impact on the results. So first off, sample preparation is in a sometimes overlooked part of the actual analysis process. However, it is extremely important to obtain the best results. Improper sample preparation can lead to poor results or worse, can potentially damage testing equipment. And while samples come in many different forms, you may have a powdered sample, formed materials, or even some sort of monolith. And while I certainly can't talk about all the different types of samples that there are, uh, the goal of this presentation is to give you a guide um, so that you can go forward and test your samples and get the best results you can using the equipment that we offer here at Micromeritics. Also, different techniques uh, or equipment require diff different sample preparation methods. Uh, we'll be covering some of these today and giving kind of a general overview of some of the different physisorption based preparation methods. An overview of my presentation um, is shown here. We're going to start talking about proper sample activation for physisorption analysis. Then we'll move into a short case study uh, where we dissect a particularly sensitive sample and how that was prepared uh, for analysis. After that, we will move to properly preparing samples for flow through testing. And we'll finish things off with a case study uh, talking about the impact of sample sizing on results in a breakthrough analyzer. So shown here, uh, we have kind of a broad suite of micromeritics physisorption based instruments such as the Gemini, HPVA, 3Flex, ASAP 2020, TriStar, AutoChem, as well as the breakthrough analyzer. All of these instruments um, either use activation um, via vacuum and heat or heat and gas flow uh, in the case of the chemisorption based uh, autochem or as well as the breakthrough analyzer. So to start off with sample activation, so nearly all physisorption experiments uh, require samples to be activated prior to analysis. So what is activation? Uh, in general, there are a couple different ways you might activate your samples. You may apply heat to the sample while also pulling vacuum on the sample. Alternatively, uh, when you don't have access to a vacuum, uh, you may flow an inert gas over the sample while applying heat. Uh, some of the most common inert gases are helium, nitrogen, and argon, all of which absorb very little at room temperatures for most materials. Activation conditions vary highly dependently based on the sample. Um, and the best 
And while I can't necessarily talk about all the different types of activations for different samples, um, there are a couple metrics that are commonly used to determine how best to activate your sample. Uh, one is to look at the decomposition temperatures of your sample. Uh, this can be quite easily done using a thermal gravimetric analysis and a thermal gravimetric analyzer. Um, it's a very effective technique for determining proper activation temperatures. Uh, what you can do is you can heat your sample up and then you can measure the gases that are released um, or substances that come off your sample um, as it is heated. Uh, this can include even going up to a temperature at which it would decompose in which you can see the decomposition products. So you know exactly where different sorts of adsorbents or solvents potentially may be released by your sample um, during the activation process. If you don't have access to that, another useful method is to kind of look at the different boiling points of either solvents um, or other you know, things like water vapor uh, that might have been uptaken by your material um, from the air. Uh, and kind of looking at the different temperatures of those boiling points, so water at 100, methanol at 65 degrees Celsius, ethanol at 78, and then DMF, for example, at 153 degrees Celsius. And it continues on and on um, as you look at less and less volatile solvents. The good news is, is that Micromeridix offers a variety of different tools to properly activate your samples. You have something like a SmartBag Prep shown in the top left, uh, which allows you to have programmed evacuation cycles as well as programmed heating cycles. Uh, you also have a variety of other instruments such as vac preps, flow preps, and then individual actual heating ports for samples. Uh, it should be important that while these tools are very useful, uh, you also need to worry that potentially particularly non-volatile solvents um, such as DMF if you're looking at synthesis of something like a MOF or other high boiling point solvents can potentially damage you know, the pumps that, uh, or, or the sample ports involved in, in the activation process. Uh, certainly you don't want to have a you know, high boiling point solvent uh, being removed from your material that later condenses within the actual sample port and can potentially damage or harm uh, future uh, studies that you do conducting using the uh, sample activation station. Additionally, some samples may require additional activation. So you can imagine that materials that absorb CO2 very strongly from the air or water, um, vapor from the air, it may become trapped within the pore space of your material during transport from the sample activation station to the actual instrument. In this case, you know, there are the option on instruments like the three flex to perform in situ degas as well, to have kind of those last heating and uh, evacuation steps to remove any CO2 or water that your material may have picked up during transport. So proper sample activation is very critical to ensure that all the adsorbed species are desorbed. And different molecules will desorb at different temperatures, largely dependent on the heat of adsorption um, for physisorption based samples. So something like water may be bound more strongly to your material than something like CO2. And activating at higher temperatures may be required uh, to break those uh, interactions. Additionally, in materials with small pores, it can be difficult to remove all species from the pore space of the material. Uh, this is something that you typically see in highly nanoporous materials, and this is one of the reasons why when performing BET measurements, we recommend that you perform the free space measurements in those materials after the analysis, as this can, can remove the potential for outgassing of helium during your actual analysis. So a common method of activating your samples, as I mentioned before, was applying heat and vacuum. Um, we can see here that this is done for a variety of different equipment that we have at Micromeridix. Uh, one example of a material you might use heat and vacuum is something like a metal organic framework or MOF, in this case copper BTC, which is shown on the bottom right hand side of the screen. Copper BTC is a nanoporous material. It has a large surface area as well as large pore volume and typically it will be activated using a two-stage uh, activation. So you'll begin by heating at 100 degrees C, 
to remove any water that's trapped within the material, and then further increasing to 200 degrees C to remove solvents such as DMF that you may have synthesized the moth in. Additionally, typically you'll use a pressure in a strong vacuum or an inert gas flow uh, to ensure the removal of any adsorbed species from the material. Heat and gas flow is also used for a variety of different instruments, um, such as you know, chemisorption-based instruments or analysis, as well as things like the breakthrough analyzer. Zeolite 13X is a microporous aluminosilicate material um, that has a large surface area and pore volume. The activation conditions for this are significantly higher than the MOF as the material is much more stable at high temperatures and can be activated typically at around 400 degrees Celsius, once again using either a vacuum or an inert gas flow. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about the differences between vacuum versus uh, flow through activation. Uh, studies have shown that both methods of act activation are suitable for a variety of different materials depending on the analysis technique and whether it requires a vacuum or, or not, your, uh, both methods can be quite effective. Flow through activation also has other advantages as well. It can be valuable for assessing the bed or column properties. Uh, this can be especially important when you look at flow through instruments like the breakthrough analyzer or AutoChem. It can help you identify pressure drop early on, which can save you time so that during your analysis you don't have any pressure drop occurring. You can also more closely mimic process conditions uh, that also require flows, as well as analyze activation procedure in real time using some sort of act outlet detector. You can speed up your activation as you will know any sort of adsorbed water, CO2, or other uh, species that become absorbed to the surface of your material, you'll be able to see them being removed in real time. So you'll know exactly when your activation is complete. So overall, both methods are very effective and just depending on the application will usually dictate which method you choose. Next, we're gonna go into a short case study looking at sample preparation of cadmium MOF 74. So first off, uh, what are metal organic frameworks or MOFs. So MOFs are nanoporous materials consisting of metal nodes connected by organic linkers. Uh, they're a topic of ongoing research search since they were first discovered in the early 90s. To date, thousands of MOFs have been synthesized in the lab. They are typically synthesized soluble thermally using solvents such as dimethylformamide or DMF. Activation in general removes the solvent from the pore space of the material. So we can see on the right a, a schematic of MOF 74. Typically in those large open pores would rest your solvent molecule as the MOF assembles around it. During activation, the ultimate goal is to remove those solvent molecules from the MOF such that you act, have access to all of the pore space that's available. In addition, MOF 74 is very sensitive to humidity into the air, uh, which can make activation difficult, um, as generally you'll need to do some sort of solvent exchange with DMF to get a more volatile solvent within the pore space and then remove that in something like a SmartVac prep. So in this case, uh, this was a study that I conducted um, alongside in, in graduate school on cadmium MOF 74. Um, and it's particularly difficult to activate and requires specific considerations beyond just activation temperature and exposure to vacuum. Pulling vacuum too quickly or heating the sample too quickly leads to pore collapse. So what ends up happening is fast removal of solvent leads to a capillary effect, in which case the solvent, inter which interacts strongly with the ligands and the moth, ends up resulting in a fast removal of solvent results in the ligands also being carried along in destruction of the moth. What was found was that by decreasing the heating rate and decreasing the, act the rate of um, a vacuum, we can actually activate the material by removing the solvent more slowly from the material, which allows for it to retain its structure and keep its excellent um, absorption capabilities. The good news is, is all of this can be controlled within the software. So in degas conditions, 
there's two separate steps that we have. We have a specific evacuation phase where we can evacuate the sample and apply heat or choose not to apply heat if we would so like. And then we have separate heating phases. And we can see here that we can control the evacuation rate, the unrestricted evacuation rate, vacuum level, as well as evacuation time. In addition, we can choose whether or not we want to ramp the temperature and we can set a target temperature as well. We can also set a hold pressure. The hold pressure is a limit such that when the sample is heating, if the pressure rises above this level, it'll stop heating the sample. This is to prevent too fast of, evacu of um, removal of solvent from the pore space of the material, which can potentially uh, lead to destruction of the material, which is what we saw originally in MOF 74 until we decreased the temperature ramp rate and evacuation rates. And then lastly, we also have a heating phase where we can program multiple different heating phases. Uh, we saw this a little bit previously in our example of the copper BTC where we had two separate heating phases, one at 100 degrees C and then one at 200 degrees C. So the key takeaways are, so sample activation involves heating a sample under vacuum or an inert gas flow to remove any adsorbed molecules. Both vacuum and gas flow are equally viable for activating samples. In general, your activation temperature is dependent on how strongly adsorbent gases, water, and other solvents bind to the material, as well as the temperature at which the, the sample will thermally decompose. You should also consider that fragile materials may require additional considerations to activate pro properly. Like we saw in cadmium MOF 74, temperature ramp rates as well as vacuum evacuation rates may also be important for your sample. Luckily, these factors can be controlled directly using the Micromeritic software as well as things like the SmartVac prep. Next, I'm going to talk about proper sample sizing. So properly sample sizing samples is an important part of the sample preparation procedure for many analysis types. Particle size is especially important in flow through systems such as the autochem, breakthrough, as well as reactors. Particles that are too small will completely fill the interstitial space between particles, which will disrupt gas flow through the system. Whereas particles that are too large will take additional time to reach equilibrium, increasing analysis time. First, I'd like to talk about pressure drop. Shown here, we have our example column with a reasonable size um, particle size, and we can clearly see that they're able to have a nice flow through the system as there is a large inner particle void that allows for the gas flow. When particles are sized appropriately, gas is able to flow through the column without disruption. The pressure drop at the inlet and outlet, there is no pressure drop at the inlet or the outlet as the pressure remains the same, and there's no pressure drop in the system. Likewise, if we decrease our particle size, we can clearly see that there's less interstitial space between each particle. As such, we will have problems with our flow. When particles are too small, gas is not able to flow through the column without disruption. What will happen is the pressure at the inlet will rise and will be greater than the pressure at the outlet. And this is why it's called pressure drop. Also, the pressure somewhere in between the inlet and the outlet, we won't necessarily know at all points within our column. Now we might have one area that is particularly dense packing that could be leading to the majority of the pressure drop, but this is very difficult to determine and is why it's, in general it is advised to limit pressure drop as much as possible. To decrease pressure drop, one of the best ways to do that is to increase the particle size and this will produce more accurate measurements. So the primary factors that affect pressure drop, as we saw, were particle size, but they are also things such as the length of the column. You can imagine as we get a larger and larger column with more and more sample packed into it, it could potentially lead to greater and greater amounts of pressure drop. Likewise, while we saw in our first example that with our moderately sized particles, we had no issues with pressure drop, but further increasing the flow rate of the gas could potentially lead to pressure drop 
as eventually the interstitial space between the particles will not be large enough to accommodate larger and larger gas flows. So how do we prevent pressure drop? Well, we already saw that one way we can do this is by sizing particles. How we can do this is you can compress your particle into a puck and then press, compress and sieve it, the particles, to a desired particle size. Uh, the optimal particle size is highly dependent on a variety of different bed factors, um, and we can't necessarily get into the perfect particle size for every sort of different flow that you're looking at. Not all samples, though, however, can be subjective to the compression um, forces. As such, there are a few other methods that can be used to prevent pressure drop. One is to disperse the sample in something like glass wool or glass beads to ensure that there is enough interstitial space between particles. If you do choose this method, it is important to, con to consider the adsorption properties of the glass wool or glass beads. Additionally, you could look to combine the material with some sort of binder uh, to kind of increase the effective particle size. However, it's also important to consider the adsorptive properties of the binder material. Nextly, uh, next, I'd like to talk about diffusion limitations. So diffusion limitations occur in large particles. With tortuous pathways, will lead you to these diffusion limitations. As we can see here, for very large particles, they will tend to have large inner particle kind of voids in different pathways. And equal equilibration will be slow as materials need to get in, diffuse through all of these different pathways. This can lead to longer experiment times in instruments such as three flexes, HPA, BVA, HPVAs, or ASAPs. Likewise, in a breakthrough instrument, what you would see is you'd have a more gradual breakthrough curve. Now, smarter, smaller particles will have less diffusion limitations. As we can see, there is just less room to have these large ca inner particular cavities, and equilibrium will be faster in adsorption-based instruments such as the Threeflex, HPVA, or ASAP. Breakthrough curves will also be steeper in instruments such as the SAA. So the primary factors that affect diffusion are that affect diffusion limitations are particle size, which we saw previously, as well as the diameter of the adsorbent gas relative to the pore size distribution of the adsorbent material. So how do we prevent pressure? How do we prevent diffusion limitations? Well, first off, one of the best methods is to size our particles. Once again, we can press the material into a puck, then crush and sieve the particles to the desired size. To speed up diffusion and decrease the diffusion limitations, we can also look at conducting measurements at higher temperatures. For something like BET, we may also want to look at using different adsorbent gases. Now, this is one of the reasons why sometimes instead of using nitrogen, you might look at using something like CO2. The benefits of using CO2 are it is a very small linear molecule and actually has a smaller kinetic diameter than nitrogen, krypton, or argon. In addition, you'll typically conduct CO2 measurements at zero degrees C, which is significantly higher than you'd conduct measurements uh, using BET via argon, nitrogen, or krypton. So in summary, looking at the pressure drop and mass transfer limitations, we saw that particle size is important for both effects. So too large of particles will lead to mass transfer limitations, whereas too small of particles can lead to pressure drop within the column. So the overall goal is to find the ideal particle size for your measurements. And this can partly be a trial and error process as it's highly dependent on things like flow rate, uh, the size of your particles, as well as your adsorbate gases that you're looking at. There are a number of ways to size particles, such as using a pellet press. We can also look to disperse particles using glass wool or glass beads to prevent pressure drop, as well as using a binder material to agglomerate particles and have a larger effective particle size. It should also be noted that mass transfer limitations may be unavoidable uh, as they are highly dependent on your actual adsorbate. So the pore size of your adsorbent uh, the relationship between the pore size of your adsorbent and the diameter of your adsorbate are highly dependent and can 
limit your ability to reduce mass transfer limitations in your material. The last topic I'd like to talk about today is a case study looking at the impact of particle size on breakthrough analysis. So first off, I'd like to give a brief description of what is breakthrough analysis. So breakthrough is an experimental technique to determine, to determine the dynamic adsorption capacity of a material. It offers many advantages over static adsorption instruments. You can more easily mimic process conditions and gas concentrations. You can easily collect multi-component adsorption data. You can as assess flow properties of your adsorbent. And you can determine things like selectivity, adsorption capacity, and heat of adsorption, as well as other properties as well. Shown on the right, we have a basic schematic of the breakthrough analyzer that was used for these experiments. We can see that we have a main gas flow that flows through a series of blending valves, which are marked in yellow. Following those, those then enter a sample column, which is contained within a furnace that we're able to control the temperature, and then finally exits the furnace, and then this, uh, the gas lines are split, one of which goes to a detector, in this case a mass spectrometer, and the other goes to a vent. So data collected via breakthrough analysis is typically referred to as a breakthrough curve and will commonly be graphed as a normalized concentration versus time. We can see at the beginning of analysis, we will have roughly no concentration that we're measuring as we're in the phase of complete adsorption, as in our adsorbent material is completely absorbing the adsorbent gas that we're passing through the column. Eventually, the column will first break through and start to rise. Uh, this is the second step in the process, which we refer to as breakthrough. The concentration will continue to rise until eventually it reaches a point of saturation, which is the concentration that you would get if you just ran the cylinder with no adsorbent um, through the breakthrough column. Data is typically analyzed via the breakthrough equation. Uh, we don't necessarily need to get into all the specifics of uh, solving the breakthrough equation on this call, um, but to give a kind of basic rundown, the area that is to the left of your breakthrough curve in general will be the total quantity of gas that is absorbed by your material. This area is shown in red in the figure. For this analysis, we looked at molecular sieve 13X. It is an alumina silicate microporous crystalline material, and it forms a cage structure in the FAU topology. It has a uniform pore size of 13 and 7.5 angstroms in diameter, and it's been shown to be viable in a variety of different active in applications, um, including those in adsorption and catalysis. It was first synthesized by Mobile in 1950s, and it has a relatively high surface area and has shown good CO2 adsorption capacity. For this experiment, I prepared two separate samples of zeolites, the 13X for CO2 adsorption analysis in the breakthrough analyzer. The first sample was using as-is material, which is typically in a pelletized form. The second sample I crushed and sieved to ensure a particle size less than 40 mesh or about 0.4 millimeters. Um, both samples were activated using the same flow rates of nitrogen, at one bar and 200 degrees C, and breakthrough measurements were conducted at 30 degrees C and one bar, or, or zero gauge pressure. Looking at our pelletized sample first, we can see that we get um, really nice breakthrough curves here. Uh, they're very sharp, which implies that there are little to no mass transfer limitations in our material. Um, if we did have mass transfer limitations, we would expect to have a much more gradual breakthrough curve. Additionally, we can see pretty consistent CO2 adsorption across multiple runs. And when looking at the, out, the pressure that's measured in our column, uh, we can see a pretty consistent pressure right around zero, uh, which is our gauge pressure in this case. Next up, when we went to the crushed zeolite 13X, uh, we saw some issues almost immediately, even during activation. Uh, so we triggered a low flow alarm, uh, was triggered almost immediately during activation, um, as the pressure reading at the outlet of the column 
as the pressure re reading at the inlet of the column uh, rose to a significantly above atmosphere, reaching about 2.2 bar. Uh, what we ended up having to do is, normally in this case, uh, we would observe the pressure drop, and then we'd go and use some sort of binder material or quartz wool to help break up the material. But for this analysis, we kind of wanted to do a case study. Uh, so what, instead, what we did is we increased the regulator pressure to get our 20 S uh, standard cubic centimeters per minute of our nitrogen flow, and then we proceeded with the rest of the activation. When we actually went to collect breakthrough data, uh, we did three experiments in succession, um, just like before. And what we can see here is that our pressure is sitting right around one bar, um, or one bar over uh, our gauge pressure. And what happens is we have our flow that is routed around uh, the sample column of our CO2 initially, which is at zero um, bar because that's where we're looking to conduct our experiments at. And when the analyses first start, we see this sharp drop in pressure because what is happening is our column pressure is right around one bar, whereas we have a zero bar roughly um, pressure of CO2 that we're routing around our column. When those two streams are blended together in our blending valves, uh, we see a sharp decrease in pressure until eventually we reach that steady state right around one bar pressure. Uh, and we see this for multiple analysis. We can clearly see here that this, you know, this is obviously going to disrupt our flow um, during our experiment. When we actually look at our results our, that come out of our mass spectrometer, we can see our breakthrough curves look relatively normal. But when we go to solve the breakthrough pressure, uh, the breakthrough equation, uh, we have a few issues that rise. The first is, you know, what is the pressure at any one point in the sample column? And the answer is, is, is that we don't know. Um, so we cannot solve the breakthrough equation um, as pressure throughout the column is unknown. Additionally, uh, the flow rate of gases is, is also unknown at high pressure, um, as high pressure nitrogen is mixed with low pressure CO2, disrupting our flow through our entire system. Uh, additionally, the pressure at any one given point in the sample column is also unknown. We don't know if pressure drop could be due to sample packing in one isolated area within the column, or it could be due to a dis distribution of material throughout the entire column, and we have potentially an even pressure drop. Uh, all in all, we, we just don't know. So the key takeaways from this are you know, eliminating pressure drop within the system is essential to solving the breakthrough equation. And while today we mostly talk about breakthrough, uh, this also applies to a lot of different flow through systems. It is ideal to limit pressure drop as much as possible to get the best results. Pressure drop in general will be evident in the system immediately after loading a sample and subjecting the column to flow. Uh, so if there is a pressure drop, you will see it build up almost immediately as you begin exposing your sample to gas flow. In general, it's advised to check the sample for pressure drop prior to activation. Uh, so whatever your analysis flow rate is, is going to be in your breakthrough or other flow through system, it's recommended to subject your sample to a, an inert flow of an equal uh, flow rate to just ensure that you don't have any pressure drop. Additionally, pressure drop will worsen as flow rate increases, uh, which is why you always want to check the system for pressure drop using the same flow as will be used during the analysis. Additionally, particles can shift a little during activation, which may lead, lead to changes in the gas flow and could potentially lead to changes in packing, uh, which could cause pressure drop to occur after activation where you may not necessarily see it before. I'd like to thank everyone for attending my presentation today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Julian. Uh, I'm opening the chat for everyone's questions now, and we already have a few. Um, early on in your presentation for physisorption and sample preparation, um, how would you recommend finding optimal analysis conditions, or are there multiple conditions that may give equivalent results? 
Yeah, so certainly there are a number of different ways that you can determine optimal activation conditions. Um, in general, I think the, the recommended steps are to look at the uh, solvents that you may be using in your synthesis or whatever procedure you use to create your sample um, and compare you know, the relative boiling points of those solvents um, to kind of figure out which ones are the highest. Uh, also ensuring that you know, whatever your sample, temp whatever temperature your sample will decompose or degrade at to make sure that you don't exceed that temperature during activation. Uh, probably one of the best analysis techniques to determine this uh, would be to use something like a thermal gravimetric analyzer. You know, by heating up your sample, you can and um, attaching it to a mass spectrometer, you can directly see different components that are coming off of your sample at what temperatures. Um, you could also run like similar experiments in something like a uh, AutoCam or another instrument that may be connected to a. Uh, mass spectrometer to, to directly see you know what temperatures it are that the various substances are coming and desorbing from your samples. Uh, I'd recommend that as you know, the best way to determine kind of the optimal activation conditions. Uh, for a good estimate, um, as I said before, you know kind of looking at the volatility of your solvents and when they um, what the boiling points are, and then going to uh, slightly above elevated temperatures for that is also kind of a good rule of thumb if you don't have access to other methods. Great. Um, for crystalline materials, um, zeolites, moth, and then also uh, the other uh, amorphous microporous materials like uh, carbons, um, if you perform in situ degassing, um, when what, how do you determine the exact mass of the sample, um, and, and when would you recommend weighing it? Yes, yeah, so generally when you're looking at performing in situ degas, that you will also have an additional activation step um, to go alongside that. Uh, the main reason for that is, you know, if, if you do have a sample that has, you know, a number of different adsorbed solvents or, you know, water vapor from the air, generally the in situ degas is kind of like your last step to remove anything that's really been absorbed from the air as opposed to necessarily like a complete activation process. Uh, because of this, you know, whatever you use for your pre in situ degas, um, I would recommend weighing your sample then. Um, I would also generally recommend that after the analysis, you know, you're probably going to backfill with something like nitrogen uh, that's most commonly used. And I'd also weigh the sample then as well um, and see how those two uh, measurements compare in terms of sample weight. In general, I usually prefer to go with the post-analysis um, weight unless you know for a fact that something's happened or occurred in your sample such that it degraded. Uh, for instance, you know, if you're looking at multiple different measurements kind of in succession and you're measuring, say, you know, surface area uh, to determine the stability of your material, if your material does degrade because you exposed it to water or, you know, some other um, sort of volatile uh, solvent using something like a 3-flex or, or other instrument and then you know it has degraded, then I would always, you know, recommend using the before sample weight um, from your pre-activation step. But as, as long as your sample um, remains uh, intact and structurally um, intact, I would recommend using the after weight. Thank you. Uh, in the first part of your presentation, uh, you really showed that nice example of the MOF structure uh, collapsing due to the evacuation rate. Um, how, how does that affect surface area when that, the structure collapses like that? Yeah, so, so certainly, um, you know, that's something that you would identify very quickly. Um, when that particularly with moths, they, they tend to have fairly high surface areas, and a lot of that has to do with their, their porosity from their actual structures. So upon degradation of the uh, metal ligand bonds in that material, you'll, you'll have a loss of structure, which you will see. 
um, in surface area measurements as a substantial loss in the surface area of the material. Um, it may not necessarily be a complete loss, but you know, looking at somewhere in the area of 80 plus percent loss in surface area. And also to go along with that, particularly the example that you had uh, given to us, uh, were you able to validate the change in the structure by any other technique? Yes, yeah, so we were also able to validate uh, using powder x-ray diffraction Great. for the loss in structure of the material. So, uh, the next question uh, concerns argon absorption and uh, natural zeolites uh, or clays. Um, is there any optimal size for these materials? Um, you know, should should people be looking at materials that uh, size-wise are less than 100 micrometers? Is that sufficient? Yeah, so certainly, you know, um, I, I think this probably has something to do with um, uh, mass transfer limitations and diffusion limitations. Uh, for argon absorption in particular, it's not something uh, that I have seen very much in zeolites or clay minerals as being a problem. Um, argon, tends, arg argon is a fair amount smaller than nitrogen. Uh, it's also monotonic, monotonic and uh, in general, I haven't seen a lot of diffusion um, limitations in a lot of zeolites or clay minerals. Um, generally, they tend to be relatively small particles. But what I will say is certainly having smaller uh, particle size in general is going to speed up measurements if you're looking at something like BET analysis, um, especially at you know, 87 Kelvin for, for argon analysis. So in terms of like an exact size, it's, it's really hard to say because um, to give like a definitive size, because there is a lot of variability in the pore size distribution of these materials. Uh, really what you're looking for is, you know, if you were to have a material that has a pore size uh, similar to argon or slightly increased, um, that's one area where you might want to look at crushing your sample um, to get faster um, analysis results in something like BET. Uh, I would say that to add to this, you know, this is especially the case really when looking at nitrogen and argon um, surface area analysis because you are conducting those at such low temperatures and that's going to slow diffusion. Uh, that is one of the reasons why some people do elect to go the route of CO2. Um, some materials are not porous to nitrogen or argon. Um, we see this a lot with various biochars um, as opposed to necessarily zeolites or clays. Um, so it is pretty common for biochars to use CO2 instead uh, because CO2 is a relatively, it's a small linear molecule and it can fit places that nitrogen and argon cannot. In addition, uh, when you conduct surface area measurements using CO2, they're generally done at zero degrees C, which is significantly higher temperature uh, then you conduct nitrogen or argon measurements, which leads to faster diffusion. Thank you. Um, when you're in the dynamic systems, when you are comparing different materials, um, so the same type of um, gases are being used, but different materials, how important is it to use the same particle size for those types of experiments? Yeah, so if you're comparing, I guess if you're running something like Breakthrough or you're running something in like an AutoChem and you're comparing two materials directly, um, if you're looking to use them in the same process and kind of like the same overall, you know, column size, um, similar, you know, diameter to length ratios, um, it to be able to fully understand kind of the different flow properties through your sample, um, if that's kind of your goal, is to be able to, you know, both both assess the absorption as well as the flow through your actual packed bed. I'd say it's very important to have a similar size uh, because that can limit, you know, the effects of mass transfer limitations. Uh, that can limit the effects of pressure drop. So to be able to like very to, to be able to equate two 
materials exactly between, you know, different runs, you know, it's very important that they have a very similar particle size because things like flow properties and flow through systems can have a very drastic effect on what the results look like or what's actually happening in your system. Um, in these uh, breakthrough systems, um, can you conduct analyses with multiple gases for evaluating materials? So effectively Certainly. Uh, that's isotherms. Sorry. So effectively competing, uh, competitive absorption. Certainly. Um, that that is one of the main advantages of both breakthrough and flow through systems um, compared to static systems. Is it is much easier to measure the outlet concentrations. Uh, for multiple components, you know, you can hook something up. There's there's a variety of different measurement detectors that you can use. Um, you know, I showed you know mass spectrometry for a single component. Um, that is a very effective method for multi-component as well. Uh, you know, there are always some limitations. Uh, probably one of the bigger limitations is obviously CO and nitrogen. So if you ever want to look at carbon monoxide and nitrogen, that can be kind of difficult because they have the, their largest peaks are both centered at 28 mass number. Um, but it is certainly much easier to conduct uh, multi-component analyses in a breakthrough or any other sort of flow-through system than it is using static absorption measurements. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of people like to do breakthrough uh, is because you can collect multi-component um, information and it's not necessarily limited to one or two components you know you can really test any number of components um, it's just really limited by what are your mass numbers relative to what your mass spec can measure um, also you know if you're using other measurement techniques like infrared spectrometry you know how do your different peaks match up there um, so there's a variety of different detectors that you can use uh, in general you know I would say it's important to realize, however, that you know whether you're doing single or multi-component in a breakthrough system, you're not necessarily going to have a one-to-one -one correlation between your breakthrough results and your static absorption measurements. And that really has to do with what we talked about a little bit today, which is you know the impact of the flow properties, the impact of multiple different adsorbate gases competing for adsorption sites, and then how that can directly impact you know the quantity of each adsorbate that's absorbed. So we've got a, a time for one last question and a, a really interesting question um, with respect to those measurements. Um, CO2 uh, seems to be uh, quite reactive for activating things like biochars. Um, and again, that also has a very active surface with all the functional groups. Um, how could this interfere with measurements? Sorry, can you repeat the question? So, uh, one, one attendee um, is basically asking, you know, if they see CO2 being very reactive uh, in some of these systems. Um, if you have a biochar, uh, which has a lot of active surface functional groups, um, could this interfere with the measurements? Um, certainly, I don't know if this is framed towards breakthrough or adsorption, so I guess I'll, I'll target it more for um, kind of like single component for static adsorption. But um, uh, certainly that is kind of one of the main issues in kind of solving for, you know, BET surface area using CO2. Um, is, you know, if you do have a material that interacts strongly with CO2 to form, you know, direct bonds as opposed to, you know, just regular kind of van der Waals forces, uh, which are generally um, the, the main mode for, for BET adsorption and calculating the BET surface area, that can definitely you know, um, impact your results. Uh, that's one of the main reasons why CO2 is generally not used, um, you know, because otherwise you'd think, um, you know, CO2 would be a great probe model, model, molecule for something like BET analysis because it's smaller than both nitrogen and argon. You don't have diffusion limitations since you can operate at higher temperatures. 
but the downside is, you know, CO2 will, in a lot of materials, is going to form stronger bonds with your materials than just necessarily, you know, regular van der Waals or, or um, interactions with your uh, material for PET analysis. Uh, this can be, you know, problematic for a variety of different materials, such as, you know, oxides or something where you may have irreversible adsorption or chemisorption uh, based interactions as well. Um, and this is one of the reasons why you don't necessarily use CO2 for all the different types of materials and, and why you use things like argon and nitrogen is because in general, you know, they don't have strong interactions with the actual material as they, they are inert. Thank you, Julian. Um, that's all the questions we have time for today. Um, if we haven't been able to get to your question, one of our application team will be in touch shortly. Uh, Julian, is there anything else you'd like to mention today? Uh, once again, I'd like to, you know, thank everyone for uh, coming to my presentation and, uh, you know, asking some, some great questions. So thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. If you have any feedback for us, we would be grateful if you could complete the survey, which will be distributed in our follow-up email. Uh, we hope you found the session beneficial. Do not forget to check back for upcoming webinars on micromerdix.com slash webinars. We hope to welcome you again soon. Thank you all.